Welcome back, genetics experts. Now that you've hopefully met with success on our unit for genetics and how genes are passed on uh, and are expressed in organisms and why we show certain traits, it's time to actually zoom in, if you will, and look at what genes really are composed of. And what we're going to be focusing on here is this guy, DNA, this molecule, deoxyribonucleic acid, blah, 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 tongue twister. Let's just call it DNA, because really, that is our secret of life, our coded instructions. So let's put ourselves in perspective. Right after Mendel uh, and some of the other scientists we'll be learning about later on, um, in the early 1900s, what did we know? Where are we in our understanding? We know that there are these factors called genes that get passed on to offspring from their parents. We know that cells divide. We know they, we said they had to copy some kind of information and pass it on to subsequent cells. And meiosis, remember, we looked at the other cell division, um, leads to sperm and eggs or gametes that are genetically not identical. They're different. And we also knew that there were these things called chromosomes that get copied and moved around. We, we've seen these things, but it still leaves us with the question, we still don't know what are these genes actually that these factors that Mendel worked with and discovered. And as we said, we also don't know what they look like and, and how do they actually work? How do they transmit information? How does whatever these genes are, how, how do they tell me to have brown eyes? How do they tell me to make a certain enzyme? And, and above all else, how do they copy themselves? Because we know from mitosis we have to copy our instructions. So we're left with some problems now, and we just want to begin by looking at a few dead dudes and a dead chick to see what they did for investigations to, to help us understand and, and put us in a place so that we can begin investigating this DNA. So as we said, let's take a look at the experiments of some famous dead guys and, and a dead chick. And, not so much worry about specifically what they did, more so what they found and conclusions they drew that helped us understand DNA. So our first famous dead dead guy here, Mr. Griffith, and look at the time period, 1928. Looks kind of like yours truly. He looks almost like Bentley. Big balding head, receding hairline, grouchy face, wrinkles, weird alien head. I, this guy could be related to me. But anyway, uh, he, he worked with a type of bacteria, and we're going to look at what he did specifically, um, his results in a second. But if you look at the bacterium's name, Streptococcus pneumoniae, certainly you probably recognize the fact that this can cause pneumonia, strep throat, a bacterium that could make people sick. In the 20s, a lot of this going around, he wanted to study that. So they realized there were two strains of this bacteria, two flavors, two varieties. One that was smooth, if you looked at it under a microscope, it actually had a smooth covering, and this caused the diseases, and one that was rough, had a bumpy outer surface, that was harmless. So let's look at what he did. If we look at this, he, he utilized poor little mice. So he got the S strain, which was harmful, he injected a bunch of mice, and the mice died. And he actually found, when we went inside and dissected these dead mice, S cells inside of them. Okay, so these bacteria got inside, reproduced, and made these mice die. Big deal. He then tried a separate set of experiments in which he injected the R strain, the other form of this bacterium, into mice, and the mice were healthy. He didn't find any bacterial cells from that R strain, so somehow the mice, this did not make the mice sick. They were able to survive. Here's where it gets good, though. He heat killed the S cells. Remember, those were the deadly ones. Heated them up so it killed the cells, injected them into mice. Now they're dead. The mice were fine. They were unable to reproduce and, and thrive in the mice. Hmm, okay, so what? And his final, the crazy part of his investigation, he mixed the harmless R cells with the now harmless heat killed S cells. So neither one of these causes a, a disease can make the mice sick. But look, when he injected the mice, the mice died. As we said, he then found S cells within the mice again. So big deal, what does that tell us? This some kind of a substance in these cells. He didn't know what it was, but somehow these heat-killed dead S cells were able to pass information to the R cells and make them become S cells, make them produce deadly toxins. Wow. Doesn't seem like a big deal, but wait a minute. What is in these cells that can pass on information like that? Kind of crazy. Well, let's keep going. Moving on to fast forwarding to the 50s. Here's where it starts to get good. Two individuals, Hershey and Chase, did an experiment with uh, viruses. 
Now, how a virus works is kind of mysterious if we look at the pictures here. Uh, looks like an alien lunar landing module, but essentially all a virus is is a protein coat on its outer edge with some type of genetic material, which they had discovered this molecule, and they found that was called DNA, composed of deoxyribonucleic acids. Uh, they actually inject something into a cell, and then they take over that cell, and it makes the cell stop what it's doing and follow these instructions and produce more viruses. Now, what they weren't sure is, does this information, these instructions, is it in the proteins or is it in the DNA? They ran a complicated series of experiments. We don't need to worry about the steps here. It's a little confusing, but they ended up finding that this information that's injected was this weird molecule called DNA. They don't know what the DNA is at this point. They know it's got some chemicals in it, but this material that gets injected here somehow passes along information that codes to make viruses. So this experiment started the arms race, if you will. Started the race to figure out, ooh, what is this DNA? What is it, and how does it work? So that brings us to this next guy. Uh, worked throughout the 40s and into the 50s, Erwin Shargoff. And all he did was he went into a wide variety of organisms. Many, many different kinds. Mice, fish, various types of plants, uh, bacteria, mushrooms, you name it, he did it. And he found this chemical, this DNA that we had mentioned before, in all of them. And he chemically analyzed them, and he found that in every single cell from every single organism, wow, what does this mean? A equals percentage of T and percent, wait, what? What he found was these four chemicals, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. These four A, T, Gs, and Cs, these chemicals were in DNA from every organism. And what he found was that whatever percentage makeup of the DNA that was made up of A, let's say 30% of the DNA was adenine, he found that he, the same percentage of thymine. So if 30% of the DNA was adenine, 30% was thymine. If, let's say, 17% was guanine, he found about 17% of the DNA to be cytosine. So A equals T, G equals C. Doesn't seem important, but it will in a second. So now the race is heating up a little bit. We're in the 50s. People know this magical substance, DNA. We know some of the chemicals that are in it, those A's, T's, C's, and G's, and there are sugar molecules in there. There's something called phosphates, but they still don't know what it looks like and not even close to understanding how it works. So bring on this lovely lass who's actually in our hallway here at school, Rosalind Franklin. She used what's called X-ray crystallography. Essentially, extracted DNA, just like Erwin Shargoff, and all that she did was took X-rays, really, of crystallized forms of that. And what she found was this image, which, okay, this infamous photograph 51, what does that show me? Well, she found that DNA had a rounded, uniform spiral shape, and it's uniform in diameter, and it had these crisscrossing uh, insides, if you will. All right, so now think about where we are. We know everything has DNA. We know that it has certain chemicals in it. We know that certain chemicals match up. We know it has a rounded, spiralish shape. Bring on our final famous guys here that are given all the credit, even though really they built upon the work of others, Watson and Crick. And what these guys did, they're famous for discovering, quote unquote, DNA, but really they had a background in biology and biochemistry. They were able to take the findings of others, the x-rays of Rosalind Franklin, and, and utilize the A equals T C equals G from Erwin Shargoff, and following rules of chemistry, they proposed that, there they are, Watson and Crick, that DNA looks like this weird spirally staircase, a double helix, which is kind of funny that they didn't do any experiments, they just built a model and they're famous. But let's look at more specifically what they propose this model is, because DNA, the secret to life, these genes, these instructions that make us have certain eye colors and uh, allow us to have specific enzymes in our bodies to help us survive is actually really simple. So, quick and easy, a double helix. Now, what does helix mean? It just means coiled or spiral. Think of a spiral staircase. It's just a ladder that's twisted. 
and the outsides, what they were able to build in their model, is made up of alternating sugars, deoxyribose, and phosphates. There's our outside of our ladder, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar. Notice that this makes up the outside. They're running in opposite directions of our ladder. And the rungs, they said, using Erwin Shargoff and Rosalind Franklin's work, are made up of these A's and T's. Naturally, they want to bond together. They want to stick together, and C's and G's. So T's bond with A, C's bond with G. There's our ladder. And naturally, inside of our cells, due to biochemistry, this molecule's twisted. It forms a spiral pattern. That's it. That's our DNA. So again, the ladder. The middle rungs are these nitrogenous bases, A's, T's, C's, and G's. Adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Hmm. That's it. Somehow, this weird, twisted ladder spiral staircase thing that everybody has, mushrooms have DNA made up of the same stuff as us. Our DNA looks just like this. But yet, somehow, their genes are not the same as ours. Hmm. So the nice thing about this model is it fit all the findings of all the other scientists. Shargoff's rule, A equals T, C equals G, because of their pairings. It fit Rosalind Franklin's x-ray crystallography and that it has a uniform diameter. It's uniform throughout. It has a twisted circular pattern. So this has got to be it. And the last thing we want to end with, let's not forget that the big picture here, that we've been focusing on chromosomes and genes so far. Remember, as we already learned in earlier videos, that DNA is literally just wrapped and coiled around a set of proteins called histones. And if we keep wrapping that tightly and coiling it, it becomes a chromosome. That a chromosome literally is just spiraled, coiled up, compacted DNA. So when we say there's a gene, again, for example, let's say, for instance, right, uh, right here, there's a gene like a big T. Really, that just means in a section of DNA, maybe from here to here, are the instructions on how to make that specific big T, whatever it may code for. So and we'll learn that in later videos. But for now, we know what DNA looks like. Time to start messing around with that.